Amen. Today we small and we will have Easter. Today I want to start a series of titled The Mysteries of Easter Revealed. The Mysteries of Easter Revealed. On the Christian calendar, you realize that we have only two festivals, two major festivals. We have Christmas and we have Easter. Next week, I'll tell you why we don't have a fixed date for Easter, but then we have a fixed date for Christmas. And then next week, I'll let you know that God did not ask any of us to celebrate Christmas or to celebrate Easter. So whether you celebrate it or you don't celebrate it, it's up to you. What is more important is the lessons we we derive and arrive from them. We know Jesus Christ was not born on December 25th, but we celebrate it anyway. We know Easter, we don't even have a fixed date for Easter. And I'll explain to you why we do that. So get ready and enjoy this series. I pray that as we hear the mysteries of Easter revealed, it will impact our lives and help us to become the kind of people heaven has ordain us to become. Amen. Amen. We agree with Deacon Bob even as he read for us. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and then verse 10. Verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not, we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, even as I share your word with your church, with your congregation, the mysteries of Easter reveal. Let me completely disappear, Holy Father. So Jesus Christ, the man of war, will appear in my life. And make me a blessing to your church in the name of Jesus. I refuse to become a bore. I refuse to speak from my mind. I refuse to disappoint. Let this word come with power. Let this word come with revelation. Let this word come with information. Let this word come, oh God, to turn our lives around to the praise and to the glory of your name. Revolution leads to revelation. I pray that through this word there will be revolution in our lives where our lives will be turned around forcefully, that we become a blessing to the body of Christ, a blessing to society, and a threat to the satanic kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. 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 If you're listening to the Isaiah chapter 53, very well. Isaiah chapter 53, theologians call it the Messianic <laughs> prophecy. Because it is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, his lifestyle, and his death. For instance, verse 1 says, Who has believed our reports, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Talking about Jesus Christ. The way he was born and his lifestyle, it is very difficult for him to be believed. So he says, Who has believed our reports, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It means that if you believe the report of the Lord, then the arm of the Lord will be revealed to you. And the arm of the Lord means the power of the Lord. So as many as will believe the report of God, these are the people who also see the arm of the Lord, the power of God in their lives. And then verse 2 says, He, the He refers to Jesus, He shall go before Him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. Jesus Christ is not going to come as a beautiful flower. He came as a root out of a dry ground, not as a fertile ground. And then David said, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. But then verse 4, where I want to emphasize, it says, he was smitten 
he was smitten by God and afflicted. Which means that Father God smote Jesus. He afflicted Jesus. Could you believe that? My version says he was afflicted as if with leprosy. And then verse 10. Verse 10 says, it pleased the Lord. The Lord here refers to Father God. It pleased Father God to bruise him. In other words, it pleased Father God to bruise Jesus. Could you believe that? Amen. Father God actually punished Jesus. And the lessons I want us to learn from Easter is that Father God punished his dear son, Jesus. It pleased Father God to bruise him. It pleased Father God to punish his son. He says he was smitten by God and afflicted. And I want to share with you just one of the punishments Father God inflicted on Jesus. One of the bruises Father God inflicted on Jesus. On that day, men crucified Jesus. But none of them were in charge. Father God was in charge. As a matter of fact, it was not because Roman soldiers and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sahindrin hated him. That's why he was arrested. That's why he went to the cross. He went to the cross because of our sins. He went to the cross because Father God ordained and allowed it. Remember, when Pontius Pilate was trialing him, right? When you read Isaiah chapter 53 again, I think verses 5. Or six. He says, verse 6 says that, like a sheep, listen, he says, like a sheep led before a shearers is dumb. He did not open his mouth. When he was being trialed, he was not supposed to talk. He was supposed to keep quiet. But then something triggered that made him speak. Pontius Pilate went to him and asked him, are you a king? And he didn't answer. Then Pontius Pilate said, won't you answer me? Don't you know that I have the power to free you or I have the power to let you die? Because he's a rabbi. A rabbi is a teacher. He had to quickly educate Pontius Pilate. So he said, no, you don't have that power unless it is given to you from above. As a matter of fact, everything that happened that day, those people were like remote control in the hands of Almighty God. Because Almighty God was punishing Jesus. Almighty God was inflicting pain and punishment on his son. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was smitten by God and afflicted. Somebody say he was smitten by God. But why would you say it like a minute? He was smitten by God. He was smitten by God. He was smitten by God. And afflicted. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Hallelujah. Let me share with you the panic, one of the punishments Father God inflicted on Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 verse 45. Chapter 27 verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land Unto the ninth hour. Amen. Amen. Now, yes, up so you understand what I'm saying. If you can close your Bible and look at me. It says, now from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, there was total darkness in all the earth. One of the punishments Father God inflicted on Jesus Christ is darkness. It says, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour. Now, the New Testament was written at the time when the Romans, when the Israelites were under the Roman government. So their lifestyle, their timing were structured by the way the Romans did their things. And to the Romans, the day start at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. So anytime you read the Bible and you see first hour, it means 7 a.m. Second hour, it means 8 a.m. Third hour, it means 9 a.m. Tenth hour means what? <laughs> Let's do it again. First hour means 7 a.m. Second hour means 8 a.m. Third hour means 9 a.m. Fourth hour means 11 a.m. Listen. From the, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, Jesus was hanging on the cross. And the day start at 6 a.m. So first hour means 7 a.m. You get that? 
So if you follow it carefully, the sixth hour is 12 noon. And the ninth hour means 3 p.m. You get me? Yeah. Now this is the time we are supposed to experience light from the sun. That's the time we see light from the sun. Brighter than any time in the day. You understand that? But then from that time, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from 12 noon to 3 p.m., there was total darkness all over the earth. That's what the Bible says. There was total darkness. And it is not normal. And it is not normal because around that same time was when Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. Father God punished his son with darkness. With darkness. He punished Jesus Christ with darkness. Remember the scripture says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was smitten by God and afflicted. Father God on that day afflicted Jesus Christ with darkness. Remember, he is the light of the world. As a matter of fact, when Jesus came, he told us a revelation that he proceeded from the Father. You know how he proceeded from the Father? You know Colossians says he's the firstborn of God's creation. So Jesus Christ is God. Listen, and he was also created by God. This is the truth. On the day of creation, Jesus Christ said, let there, God said, let there be light. And there was light. <coughs> that was the first thing he created. If you study the Bible very well, thereafter, we are told in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, God created two lights. The greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. The greater light, he called it the sun. And then the lesser light, he called it the moon. But earlier in verse 3, chapter 1, he said, let there be light, and there was light. That light was not an ordinary light. That light was the light that proceeded from the Father. That light was the first thing that God created before he created every other thing. That light is Jesus Christ. Because that light came from him. You understand that? So that's why John said, when Jesus Christ came, he said, I'm the light of the world. Because without that light, nothing was created. That's why the Bible says all things were created by him, for him, through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Bible says in chapter five, verse, chapter 1, verse number 5, that this light shines in darkness. And darkness could not comprehend him. But on that faithful day, he was punished with darkness. The light of God was punished with darkness. There was total darkness in all over the world. For three solid hours, from the ninth, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from 12 noon till 3 p.m., there was darkness. Why that darkness? Why did Father God punish Jesus with darkness? It is because the sins of the whole world was put on Jesus. And darkness and sin, they are synonymous. They go together. So on that day, Jesus Christ carried the sins of the people who are dead long time ago. And the sins of the people who were in his time. And the sins of the people who are yet to be born. The sins of me and you. The sins that we committed yesterday. The sins that we are committing whilst we are even sitting here. And the sins that we commit in future. He carried all on the cross. And that's why he was punished with darkness. He was punished with darkness. Father God punished his son with darkness. And the lesson we can learn from this is this. So that when we receive him as our personal savior, we no longer walk in darkness, but then we walk in the light of God. He became our substitute. He became our replacement. Remember before he came, we were walking in sin. We were, Bible says in chapter 2, verse 19, Ephesians, that we who were once strangers and foreigners, now we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of faith. Before he came, we were strangers and foreigners. Before he came, we were walking in darkness. Before he came, we were living in sin. When Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered into this world. So everybody who comes into this world automatically becomes a sinner. So a child born today is a sinner. As a matter of fact, you are not a sinner because of the sins you commit or the sins you don't commit. You are a sinner because you came to this world through natural birth. Everybody who comes into this world through natural birth is a sinner. And as a result of that, it's in darkness. But on the cross on that day, Jesus Christ carried our sins. So that when we receive him, we will walk in the light of God. Amen. So church, if you are a child of God, you are not supposed to walk in darkness anymore. And prove that you have received him as your personal savior. 
and prove that you have a relationship with him is that you walk in the light. Why did God have to punish Jesus with darkness? It is because Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. So Father God had to reward Jesus Christ with the death of darkness. That's why for three solid hours, he was bruised, he was chastised, he was afflicted with darkness. That is why Bible tells us, church, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16. He says, let your light so shine before men. Why should you let your light shine? Because now you have the light of Jesus in you. Remember, he said in John chapter 1, verse 5, that the light shines in darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. So if you took your sins, and now you have your light, let your light shine in the world. As your light shines, people will see your good work. And then they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Church, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and we do not know the truth. Mm -hmm. So if you call yourself a Christian, walk as a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, talk as a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, do the things Christians do. Unfortunately, we call ourselves Christians by words. We talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk. So it is difficult for us to win people for Jesus. It is difficult for the world to see Jesus Christ in us. But remember, Father God had to punish him with darkness so that as we receive his light, we will walk in the newness of life and then the light of God will shine in our lives. Because you are the light of the world, you are also the salt of the earth. You know what salt does? Two important things. Salt gives tastes. And then it also gives preservation. So church, you are supposed to give taste to people. Taste of holiness, yeah. taste of righteousness, taste of the goodness of God, taste of the love of Jesus Christ. Let the world taste it through your life. And then preserve holiness. We live in a time that holiness is completely disappearing from our schools, disappearing from our homes, disappearing from our workplaces. People care and their conscience doesn't even break them. People care and they think it is part of them. Church, a proof that you are a Christian is that you preserve holiness because you are the salt of the earth. Is somebody understanding me? Yeah. Hallelujah. So if we talk the talk, church, let us also walk the walk. I keep on telling you, the fifth book of the New Testament is called the Acts of the Apostles. God is so very wise. He didn't call it the Act of the Holy Spirit. You realize it was the Holy Spirit who was working in the lives of those people, right? But it was never called the Act of the Holy Spirit. It is the Act of the Apostles which means that they were noted by their acts, by their deeds, by their behaviors, by their character. So if you are a Christian, let your character follow you. Let the character of Christ follow you. As a matter of fact, the word Christian comes from Christ-like. And it happened in Antioch, in the country called Syria. When Jesus Christ died, his followers saw the way he was living. They realized they were talking like him, they were walking like him, they were behaving like him. They did everything like him. Their lifestyle was just like him. So they called them, they called them Christ-like, Christ-like, Christ-like. And eventually it became Christians. The term Christians was not even given by God. It was the unbelievers who saw the lives of the followers of Jesus Christ in Antioch, in Syria, and called them Christians. So let unbelievers call you Christians. Yeah, yeah. You are not a Christian because you call yourself a Christian. Let them call you Christians. They will call you Christian not because you go to church. They will call you Christian not because you talk in tongues. They will call you Christian not because you tell in tongues. They will call you Christian because you live it. So let's live it, church. And the reason why the world is not coming to Jesus is because they are not seeing anything in us. Amen. We go to church, they also go to church sometimes. <laughs> we drink, they also drink. We smoke, they smoke. We tell lies, they also tell lies. Mm -hmm. Almost everything we do, they also do. The difference is that we go to church and they are not regular attendants in church. And that's why their lives is not changed. Church, if you really mean business to work with God, you need a drastic revelation. Revelation leads to revolution. And revolution means a forceful turn around in each one of us. We need a forceful turn around in our lives. Right. And it happens when we get this revelation 
the revelation that Father God punished his son with darkness. So that after we receive him, then we also walk in the light of God. So as people see our deeds, they want to follow Jesus. None of us is saved because of our works. But we have been saved for works. For instance, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says, for by grace are you saved through faith, Hallelujah. and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of your works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. But then after you become Christian, verse 10 says, we are his workmanship, yeah. created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has ordained before the foundations of the world, that we should walk in them. So after you become a Christian, then you are created for works, for works. You are created for works. That works has to do with character. That works has to do with good deeds. Yes. That works has to do with behavior. Yes. That's what has to do with attitude. Yes. It is only your attitude which will determine your altitude. Yes. And not the way you say it, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 2. It says that you are the epistle of God. Read of all men. You are the epistle of God. Church, the world, you see, the Bible is a spiritual book, remember? <laughs> so when the world read it, it will, they will never understand. The reason why they will not understand is because the Bible is not a natural book. Somebody can easily read physics, read economics, read accounts, and read math, and understand it easily. But the Bible, unless your spirit is regenerated, you'll never understand. Yeah. So the reason why the Bible doesn't mean a thing to the people in this world is because when they read it, they get confused. Mm -hmm. They get confused because their spirit man is dead. So the sure Bible they will read is you. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 says you are the epistle. Another word for epistle mm -hmm. is the Bible, the word of God. You are the epistle of God read by the people of this world. So they will read your life. And then to give them direction. They will read your life and then to give them instruction. They will read your life and then it will tell them what to do and where to go. You understand that? But then if you don't exhibit the Christian character, the Christian attitude, what will they see in you? I remember when David killed Uriah and took his wife. The prophet came to David and said, because of what you have done, you have given the enemies of God an occasion to speak against the name of the Lord. Do you believe that? You have no idea how our negative attitudes impact people negatively. How our negative attitudes adversely affect people so they don't want to have anything to do with church. So you've got to sit up. The world is reading you. It's not the things you say, it's the things you do. Don't you understand actions is louder than words? So they read you, whether you like it or not, they read you. At home, they read you. At workplace, they read you. Your neighbors read you, they watch you. So if you talk the talk, walk the walk. Galatians chapter 1, verse number 24. Paul said they glorify God because of me. Because they realized he was a changed person. Because they realized God had turned his life around. They realized the one who was killing people for because the preach Jesus is not ready to be killed for his faith. Yes. That is what genuine Christianity is. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So church, I want to admonish each one of us. Our Lord is calling each one of us to live a life that is worthy of emulation. Mm -hmm. Our Lord is calling each one of us to do things that will bring glory and praise to his name. And if we do this, we are going to gladden the hearts of God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me share with you the second punishment God inflicted on Jesus, and then I'll end. From what we read, chapter 27, verses 45. Let's read verse 46. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Good, thank you. So, then when it was the ninth hour, Jesus cried and said, Eli, Eli, I will say Eli, Eli. Actually, how you pronounce it depends on where you went to school and who was your teacher. So, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. Eli, Eli, lama sabatani. And this is the meaning. The meaning is very important. 
He said, my God, my God. Somebody say, my God, my God. My God, my God. He said, my God, my God. Why have that forsaken me? <laughs> now, if you are a good student of the Bible, you will know this was the very first time in Jesus' life that he addressed his father as God. <laughs> that day, he couldn't call him father. Because he lost his sonship rights. So the second punishment is that he lost his sonship rights. Why did he lose his sonship rights? Because the sins of the whole world was put on him. He was punished with darkness. So within that three hours, he was never regarded as the son of God anymore. That is why he couldn't call him father. There is a difference between God and father. He is a God to everybody in this world. But a father to only Christians. Why is he a father to Christians? Because we have to receive Jesus as our personal savior. When you ask Jesus to come into your life, when you ask Jesus Christ to turn your life around, when you ask Jesus Christ to become the Lord and Savior over your life, and then you change your fatherhood from Satan to Almighty God. This will sound weird, but let me tell you this. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus told the Pharisees, You are of your father, the devil. Does that mean it was the devil who impregnated their mothers? No. Does that mean it was the devil who created them? No. Why did Jesus tell them, You are of your father, the devil? It is because we have only two fathers in this world, spiritually. Almighty God and Satan. Now, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, they literally sold their birthright to Satan. And Satan became the God of this world. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Satan is the God of this world. And because he's the God of this world, he becomes a father to everybody who comes into this world. But then you change your fatherhood when you grow and you mature, you know your left from your right, you receive Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord, and you go through baptism. That's why we don't baptize children. Because children don't know their left from right. Anybody who baptizes since children doesn't understand the Bible. And baptism is not also sprinkling. It is immersion. You are put in water. I will explain eventually why we don't put water on the head of people and that is not baptism, that is something else. As a matter of fact, baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo. And baptizo means to be covered, to be enveloped, to be overshadowed. So when the water is put on your head, you are not covered. But what I'm trying to say is, you literally receive Jesus as your personal savior. When you do that, you change your spiritual identity. And then Satan no longer becomes your father, but Almighty God becomes your father. So on the cross, Jesus lost his sonship rights. So that when we receive him as a personal savior, we can call ourselves sons and daughters of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Father God made him lose it so we can gain it. Yeah. And you have no idea how many people have lost it. Yeah. I have this blue thing in my hand. I plan to give one to everybody. Let me start with you. Okay. I had this and emotionally it touched my heart. In North Carolina alone where we are, we have nine. We have 5.8 million people who don't have relationship with Jesus. It means that Jesus is not their father. It means that the death of Jesus Christ is so not relevant to them. 5.8 million people in North Carolina, and within five miles radius where we do church here, there are 300,000 people. Who don't have relationship with Jesus. Mm. 300,000 people, church, within five miles where we do our church. Mm. We have 300,000 people who don't have relationship with Jesus. All over the world, we have 6 billion people who are not saved. 6 billion people, they are not saved. If they die, they will go to hell. We have 1.2 billion people who live with people who have never heard of Jesus Christ. So you see, you, you have a lot to do as a child of God. And that is why coming to church and going, coming to church and going, you are not helping the kingdom of God. God wants us to make disciples. When was the last time you talked to somebody about Jesus? How will you feel when people go to hell and then you are in heaven and then you can hear them screaming your name? Why didn't you tell me? I work with you. But you never told me. I live close by your side. But you never told me. I saw you some time ago. But you never told me. How will you feel? 
Church, how you feel? So why would you take a deliberate effort and depopulate the kingdom of, God, of Satan and increase the kingdom of God? It is so easy. All they need to do is to do the talking and Holy Ghost will do the conviction. Just do the talking. Tell them about Jesus. Let them know how God loved them. Share your life experience with them. Let them know how useless you were before you gave your life to Christ and he turned your life around and where he's taking you. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So you don't need to know everything in the Bible before you preach. The little that you know, share with somebody, share with your neighbor, share with your roommate, share with the people you meet at Walmart, share with the people you meet at Target, share with the people you meet at your workplace. You have no idea the impact. Because it is the gospel that turns people's life around. What is the gospel? Second, First Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4, explains what the gospel is. The gospel has to do with the life of Jesus Christ. Has to do with the death of Jesus Christ. Has to do with the burial of Jesus Christ. Has to do with the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And church, this is Easter. This is Easter. And this is what you have to preach. So when we talk of Easter, Easter is when you talk to somebody about Jesus, what Jesus Christ came to do for us. This is the power of God unto salvation. This is what turned the lives of people around. And I entreat every one of you, have a burden to raise somebody for Jesus. Jesus gave a parable about a rich man and Lazarus. With all his money, with all his wealth, with all his fame, with all his popularity, the rich man went to hell. He was shocked. On earth, he didn't believe it. Then he said, Father Abraham, could you please let Lazarus dip his finger into water and come and put it on my tongue? Because I'm really, really, really thirsty. And Abraham said, no. You found all your enjoyment on earth already. Then the rich man said, please, one more plea. I have five other brothers on earth. Five. Five brothers. They don't know this thing you are talking about. If they die, they also be at where I am. So please, send somebody and tell them that their brother is suffering in hell. He wants them to change so they don't come to this place. You won't believe the answer Father Abraham gave to him. But Abraham said on earth they have Moses and the prophets. If they have ears, they will listen to them. Why would you be like Moses and one of the prophets? To the unbelievers who do not know Jesus. Why would you be like Moses and one of the prophets? To your next door neighbor who has never heard of Jesus. Why would you be a Moses and one of the prophets? To your co-worker, your classmate who do not have Jesus. Church again, if the main reason why God saved us was to make us go to heaven... Like the very day we got saved, you will let it die, so we'll be in heaven. Because heaven is a million times better than here on earth. But the reason why we are still here is that he wants us to talk to somebody about Jesus. Mm -hmm. He wants us to become disciples and then make disciples. That is what he called us to do. Amen. Amen. I pray for you that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. Maybe you are here and you don't even have a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you are here and your spiritual understanding is not enlightened. Maybe you are here and you are not too sure where you go when you die. Church, take advantage of this moment. Why would you give your life to Jesus? Because tomorrow might be too late. He might even come before I finish preaching. He might come before I get home. Apart from all that, death is inevitable. Any one of us may die anytime. One of my Favorite, I don't know whether I should call him favorite or unfavorable or whatever, is Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela. This man came to New York addressing the United Nations and pointed at President Bush and said, The devil is here, the devil is sitting right here. Everybody was shocked. He said, The devil is sitting right here. He was so arrogant and proud. Four days ago, he died. With all his money, he's one of the reasons why terrorists were rising. Everything that the United States supports, he will be against it. Everything that the United States wants to stand for, he wants to fight against it. He will want to spend his rich oil money to promote them that are enemies of the United States. He had cancer. And he struggled, 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 struggled. He died. With all his money, his wealth couldn't save him. 
Any one of us can also die. But what you've got to know is Hebrews 9.27. It is appointed unto everyone to die once, once, once. After their judgment. Are you ready? Are you ready when you die? Why would you take advantage of this moment and check your relationship with Jesus Christ? First John chapter 5 verse 16. You see, some people say, well, I'm not too sure whether I'll go to heaven or not. God will decide on that day. Some think, well, it is only God who will know the truth. No, it doesn't work like that. First John chapter 5 verse 16. He said, these things have I written unto you that you may know, you may know that you have eternal life. That is when you believe in Jesus Christ. So when you have Jesus Christ, you know you have eternal life. <laughs> he said, I am the door. Yeah. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. He shall go in and out and find pastures. John 10, 9. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever, whosoever, whosoever includes you, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So you will know whether you have everlasting life or not. And take advantage, receive him as your personal savior. Can we close our eyes this moment? Everybody close your eyes with me. In your heart of heart, you know you are not saved. You see, Christianity is not churchianity. The fact that you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Jesus Christ was born in a garage, but he didn't make him a car. So church doesn't make you Christian. A Christian is somebody who has a personal relationship with Jesus. If you are not sure whether you have a personal relationship with him, why would you say this after me? Dear Lord Jesus, this morning, I receive you as my personal Savior. Please come into my life. Forgive me all my sins. Make me a new person. This morning, I receive Jesus as my personal Savior. This morning, I change my spiritual identity. And I have Jesus as the Lord and the Savior, the Father of my life. Thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And they want to pray another prayer. You are a Christian, all right. But you realize you've not been a very effective Christian. Let's be sincere to ourselves. Do you think God is pleased with your life as a Christian? Because Jesus Christ was punished with darkness so that you always walk in the light of God. And maybe there are still some sins in your life. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 says, Since we are compared by so great a cloud of witnesses, verse 2, let us lay aside every weight and the sins which so easily entangles us. You are a Christian, but maybe there are some sins that are entangling your life, or some weights that are entangling your life. It is not helping you to live the Christian life, to walk the Christian walk. I want you to Pray this prayer after me. Maybe it might be drinking. Maybe it might be smoking. Maybe it might be gambling. Maybe it might be lust. Maybe it might be envy. Maybe it might be jealousy. Maybe it might be laziness or one thing or the other. You know yourself better and God knows you. And there is nothing wrong when you have a problem. But everything is wrong if you don't change from that problem. He created you. He knows who you are. Psalm 103 verses 14 says, He knows your frame. He remembers that you are dust. He created you. He knows your frame is. He knows your general composition and your order. He knows that although you are, you are spirit, he also created you with dust, the body, which is susceptible to sin. So there is nothing wrong when you have weakness. But everything is wrong if you will not surrender your weakness to him. Why don't you pray this prayer for me? If you know you have a weakness which is affecting your spiritual growth and which is affecting you becoming effective for Jesus. Say this after me, dear Lord Jesus. This morning, your word has come to me. I want to live the practical Christian life. So help me, Lord, to overcome every sin, to overcome every weight, to overcome every shortcoming, to overcome every infirmity. So in my household, at my workplace, in my school, wherever I go, people will see Jesus in my life. Not because I tell them, but because they see me live it. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Finally, if you are here and you are not a member of Family Cathedral, we want to give you the opportunity to do that. If you are here and you are not a member and you feel like, if you are a member of our church, I want to see you by show of hands. So I'll know those who are for us and those who are against us. If you are a member of us, the against is just a joke. Don't, don't take it serious. I want to see you by show of hands. If you are a member, if you are a member, okay, good. Those who are not members, if you want to be, join us, if today you want to come and become a member of the church, I want to see you by share of hand. We want to come forward, please, so I pray for you. If you want to become a member of Family Cathedral, thank you, Sister, Sister Randy. Are you still contemplating? Because I didn't see your hand up. Are you with us? Uh, I, have, I, have, I have two homes. Okay. I'm with How about you? I wanted, I wanted to join them when all my family was here. I wanted my kids and everybody to be up there with me. Okay. And they're not all here. Okay. Let's go, with Sister Randy. <laughs> so today, Sister Randy is coming to join Family Cathedral and become a member. Sister Randy, we really appreciate your willingness to be a member of Family Cathedral, it also means that you are going to submit yourself to the leadership of Family Cathedral. Mm -hmm. It also means that from today you change your friends. Mm -hmm. We are going to be your friends. We are going to be there for you. We are going to be there for us. We are going to pray for you. We are going to stand by you. We are going to help you grow as a Christian, okay? Can we all lift up our voices and pray for her? Yes. That Father God will strengthen her yes. in the name of Jesus. And lift up your voice, stand by you. Holy Father, in the name of Jesus. Shandere Baba Le Baba Brondere Makutu Stiki Andere Mofaya. We pray for your daughter, Randy. I pray that even as she decided to join Family Cathedral today, every gift, every strength, every ability in her, she also bring it so that your church will grow to the praise and to the glory of your name. In the name of Jesus, give her submissive spirit and the heart to learn so she will follow us as we bring her before your presence, presenting her holy and complete before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before she sits